world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to Rebank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to Rebank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by acclaimed author Dave Birch, back on Rebank for round two. Dave previously joined us on episode 24 to explore developments in digital identity. Dave is an internationally recognized thought leader in digital money and digital identity. He's been named one of the global top 15 best sources of business information by Wired Magazine, one of the top 10 most influential voices in banking by the financial brand, one of the top 10 Twitter accounts for innovators by PR Daily, and one of the top three most influential people in London's fintech community by City AM. Dave is perhaps Europe's most influential commentator on emerging payments and adjacent technologies, including digital identity, blockchain, and privacy. Dave recently published a new book called Before Babylon, Beyond Bitcoin, which looks at money as a concept and the ways it may evolve. Today, we look at the current crypto boom and what it's telling us about the future of money and economies. As always, connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on our website at bankingthefuture.com. If you're a regular Rebank listener, please sign into iTunes and leave us a review. It helps others find the show. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Dave Birch. Dave, welcome back to Rebank. Thanks for having me back. I won't go through your full bio. People can get that in episode 24 when you first joined us. But um, I suppose for completeness, has anything changed? Uh, yes. So uh, because my my first uh, book was reasonably successful and my new book... Did I mention I have a new book out, by the way? I can't remember if I mentioned that yet. My new book, um, I flatter myself, has been tolerably successful as well. I've decided to step back a little from the consulting business, so uh, my partners have uh, have allowed me to uh, to go part time uh, at Consult Hyperion, and uh, I'm spending more of my time out uh, speaking and writing um, and uh, putting together some 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 ideas for a new book as well. So yeah, I when I saw you last time, I was a consultant who'd written a book. Whereas now I'm, a, I'm an author who does some consulting. Mm-hmm. So. And how are you enjoying the newfound flexibility? Well, it's only been a couple of months so far, but, but so far, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I, I, the writing stuff is fun and I like it. All right, so I want to get into the, uh, the topic of the book, which you actually, I think, picked up, I guess maybe dug into to a, a specific uh, topic in a Medium article that you put out earlier this month, which I found fascinating, which kind of talks about the role of tokens in the future of economies. Yes. So, so what had happened was um, I, I'd, I'd mentioned to somebody that uh, I, I remain, you know, slightly skeptical about Bitcoin's long term. Um, and, you know, of course, said, well, Bitcoin now it's worth $3,000 or $5,000 or whatever. So how can you be skeptical about the long term? And I mentioned in passing that I thought cryptocurrencies as a platform for future financial services were more interesting than the cryptocurrencies as a currency, if you see what I mean. Um, And of course, the example to hand was the whole kind of madness around the token and ICO marketplace. And so I'd, you know, I'd said in passing that I thought in many ways that token ICO space was actually more interesting than the cryptocurrency space and so I was I was challenged to defend that and so I wrote a blog piece which people liked and so then I turned it into a longer piece and a magazine article and now a book chapter and that's how these things happen basically yeah. so the premise uh, if I can summarize it and then you can correct me is uh, was basically thinking about the cryptocurrency space today you know things like bitcoin is potential um means of value exchange 
and kind of extrapolating beyond that and looking at what specific ICO like tokens that are issued by companies uh, effectively uh, in exchange for future provision of goods and services uh, yes, might, so, might look like. Yeah, so my thinking was that the tokens so let's so let's let's we have a we have a generalized cryptocurrency platform of one form or another. That platform uses some sort of shared ledger or one form or another, which has some sort of native token of one form or another. But the point is these tokens are cryptographically secured so we don't have to worry about that part of it so now we have a global platform that has these secure tokens what kind of things might we use it for now and, and one of those things became the, this initial coin offering marketplace where people began to raise capital for enterprises using you know what to be completely honest are a form of unlicensed pseudo security which the SEC, not unsurprisingly, um, has has made mention of. However, I think there's a there's an intellectual resonance between this use of tokens as a as a an innovative cross between the, you know they're, they're part equity, part bond, part sort of money, um, part loyalty, the, part loyalty scheme. That's right. Um, but I think there's actually an intellectual context for that, which I, I thought perhaps people in the crypto space wouldn't have been aware of. And because I touch on it in my book, I thought it would be an interesting example to amplify. So in my book, I look at who might create money in the future and uh, you know, to simplify the discussion and to structure it. Uh, I have this, this five C's model which which is you know good enough to, to to stimulate discussion and those five c's are central banks uh, because remember central banks don't create money now commercial banks do but there's an argument which says central banks could use these new technologies to to simply run money themselves you could have something like mpesa but run by the bank of england for example um, so the first C is central banks. The second C is commercial banks. In other words, we create money pretty much as we do now, except the central the central bank gives commercial banks permission to issue, and they issue in a purely digital form. And actually, we saw some experiments with this a few years ago with things like Mondex and so on. So that's that's also a possibility. The third C is companies, because. Um, you know, banks have this special case and privileged position. But you could imagine circumstances in which companies issued their own money. We'll come back to that in a moment. The fourth one was cryptography, of course. We could have cryptocurrency. And the fifth one is communities. So for a variety of reasons, I don't want to drag into this at the moment, I have a deep-seated suspicion that the lowering the entry barrier into the money business, which would lead to, you would imagine, the creation of lots more kinds of money... Um, uh, means that we'll be looking at a future that has a great many different kinds of money. We're not going to have a world currency or a galactic credit or, or whatever. So which of those currencies will will sustain? And I, you know, there are people other than me who talk about, uh, you know, value-based and emotional uh, connections with money. And so I have a suspicion that money is in some way going to become more closely related to the communities that it serves. So my fifth C was communities. Because now you can argue, of course, that the cryptocurrencies and the companies and back their special cases of those communities, and I think that might be right, but that's not relevant to the argument right now. So those are the five C's. So let's go back to that middle C, which is companies. So let's imagine that instead of money being issued by the Bank of England or by the commercial banks, what if money is issued by companies? And at first, that sounds a little bit confusing because you wouldn't want a thousand different types of money in your wallet. And how would you know what to pay with when you get on the bus? But you have to sort of skip past that and imagine, you know, stop mentally picturing you reaching into your wallet and handing some coins and notes to the bus driver. Instead, imagine your smartphone interface to your AI machine learning data analysis cloud giant killer robot 
is talking to the bus companies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data cloud, giant killer robot. So it isn't you talking to the bus driver and trying to work out, it's, it's you know, your smartphone talking to the bus. And your smartphone and the bus are perfectly capable of negotiating a zillion different currencies and working out which transfers to make. So in a world where there are lots of these different kinds of private currencies, um, you could see some different dynamics. Now, it happens that a generation ago, effectively, in the early 90s, there was a guy called Edward de Bono, who, who's famous to us of, I mean, you probably had to go on some of these same management training courses that I did, that you had to sit around with different colored hats on, and, and this is Edward de Bono. And he wrote this book called Lateral Thinking. He was famous, well, he still is famous for, for trying to get people to think differently and, and this sort of thing. Very interesting guy. And in the early 90s, he wrote this pamphlet called The IBM Dollar, which he wrote for the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation in the city here, um, which had a very profound impact on me. I mean, when I read it, I immediately realized that this guy was onto something. And I, I couldn't quite work out how, but I could see that what he was saying was right. And what he said was, for a variety of arguments to do with liquidity and so on and so forth, in the future, instead of issuing equities that are traded on stock exchanges or bonds which are traded uh, on desks and um, same way, why don't companies just issue their own money? And so he said, why doesn't IBM just issue IBM dollars? And to buy IBM goods and services, you need IBM dollars. And so when a company starts up, it issues its own money, and that money would initially trade at a huge discount. So I, I create, I don't know, Dave's time travel or something like that, which, which by the way, is more plausible than, than half of the ICO pitches that I've seen. So I say, well, I'm going to create a company that's going to do time, so Dave's new company, and I'm going to issue Dave money. And at first, you'll, those Dave money, they'll, they'll trade at cents on the dollar because who knows whether this is ever going to exceed or not. But just as VCs would take a punt, maybe people would add some to their portfolio. Then over time, as Dave Co. becomes more successful, the value of Dave money goes up because more people want Dave money in order to buy Dave things. Uh, and, uh, and the value of Dave money is continuously established in the market by its exchange rate with other currencies. And De Bono said, and this is, this is where it struck me as, uh, remember, remember this was written years ago. He said, when you come to buy something, your computer system, I mean, he was writing this before the internet, before smart cards. And he said, you know, your computer system and your seller's computer system can get together and work out which basket or which, which portfolio of these monies needs transferring from one person to the other, you know, depending on a variety of policies that you might have in place. And you wouldn't need somebody else's money as an intermediary because trades would take place between these baskets. And, and these things would be highly liquid, of course, because, um, because they, would, they would have this foreign exchange market constantly running so you would always be able to trade these these portfolios and I, I you know I've written about that before and I've mentioned it in a couple of other things I've written before um, but of course there was all this always this well how exactly would that work and then of course along comes this whole world of shared ledgers and, and cryptocurrencies and then a couple of years ago you begin to see tokens and ICOs and I begin to sort of ruminate on whether these technologies might be the right technologies and then we, of course we see the ICO thing go through the roof and I've come to the way of thinking which I think I defended reasonably well in that medium piece I've come to a way of thinking which says you know what um, the cryptocurrency ICO guys might not see it that way but in essence what they're doing is constructing you know de Bono's vision um, in, a, in a practical and implementable way. And once we get past the, in, you know, the current South Sea bubble style craziness, once we, once we get a regular, I'll come back to the 
bubble thing in a moment. But once we get to a regulated uh, ICO world where investors can can essentially buy these corporate tokens instead of conventional equity and debt and money, um, then we're in this new world. We're, we're in a new, a wholly new financial services marketplace, which, if he's right, um, is a vastly more efficient financial services marketplace. And that strikes me as being really interesting. Now, the second part of the thread that brought me to the same conclusion is more from the regulatory side. So the history of bubbles, you know, I mean, people always talk about Bitcoin in the, the tulip bubble, but of course, a lot of people don't really realize what the tulip bubble was. The tulip bubble was to do with the fact that people were buying futures and options in a market where there were no futures and options, contracts, regulations, whatever. The whole thing blew up and out of that came a market in which futures and options existed and Amsterdam went on to become the trading capital of the the world, you know, the Dutch golden age and, and all this kind of thing. It's what comes out of the bubble, which is a regulatory construct, which is interesting. You know, you, you, you fast forward to the, somebody was on Twitter yesterday saying, oh, well, it's like the railway mania of, the, you know, the Victorian railway mania where everybody was selling everything they owned in order to buy railway company stocks, which crashed. And uh, the railway companies, which were then occupied the same position in the economy as big banks do now. I mean, they were the, uh, they were the biggest companies in, in the world. Um, the railway companies went cap in hand to the Prime Minister, Disraeli, for a bailout, and he told them to get lost. Um, you know, nowadays, of course, you know, the Prime Minister's advisors are all investment bankers, so when they go cap in hand, they get the money. But in those days, they were told to sod off. And you might notice, by the way, that we still have railways and we still have railway companies. So, um, but the fallout from that was accounting standards. Because up until that, nobody had any way of valuing what any of these companies were worth because there was no standard way that people kept their books. There were no standard definitions of depreciation and all this sort of thing. So out of the railway bubble came, you know, accounts. And because you had accounts, you had this boom in Victorian capitalism because you could now invest in things all around the world because you had standardized accounts that you could read and you had auditing and, and all this sort of thing. Um, and then you had the 29 crash and out of that you had Glass-Steagall and the separation. So, so there's a line of thinking which says, you know, what comes out of bubbles uh, sets in place economic growth because you have this next phase of the economy. That's a very interesting line of thinking. So the question is, what might come out of the great financial crisis? You know, I'm not sure we've seen it yet. We've seen some tinkering, but I'm not sure if we've seen the vigorous um, narrative of building a new financial services marketplace. It's a plausible hypothesis, um, and the subject of my next book, by the way, um, but it's a plausible hypothesis that the core narrative to emerge from this is one that's around transparency. And, and that, of course, again, has resonance with this world of shared ledgers and blockchains and cryptocurrencies and so on. So it seems to me that if you put those two things together, the desire for a more efficient, more liquid market, a more modern way of, of funding large-scale enterprise, and you link that with the inevitable, I think, regulatory drive for uh, you know, more transparency, this sort of ambient accountability, as I, as I like to call it, then you begin to see uh, at least the outlines of a realistic vision of a very different financial service and better financial services marketplace and so and so that's a very very long-winded way of saying that's why i think the token ico world actually tells us a little bit more about the future of financial services than necessarily the cryptocurrencies do by themselves mm. i actually uh find that last point particularly interesting the one around increased transparency because i think um you know traditionally markets have kind of been the gray space that exists between people and their stuff yeah and in the model that you're describing the market becomes uh, you know implicit 
fraud prevention because there is transparency around who's doing what. Now it's not. Um, it's kind of a public key, private key sort of thing. You can associate individuals with types of transactions and reveal uh, identity if necessary for uh, legal means over time. But it correct. does provide rigor and, as you call it, accountability to everything that goes on around trading, producing, consuming in a way that, that simply hasn't uh, ever existed in the past. Yes. And in fact, transparency is people get the wrong idea when you say transparency because they think that means everything's visible to everybody, which isn't quite what I mean. Um, in fact, in in um, in the uh, book chapter that I've just finished about this with my with my former colleague Salome Paralava, um, we refer to translucent transactions, which is a term stolen again from the from the early nineties. Um, so you use the metaphor of translucency, you know, when like when you have a translucent window, you can sort of see the outline of something, but you can't see the detail. It's that kind of idea, you know. I can see that your bank is solvent because I can go to the ledger and I can see that your assets exceed your liabilities um, without actually knowing what any of those individual assets or liabilities are. It's that kind of thing. And, and I think if you, if you have that sort of notion uh, linked to these more efficient new forms of equity slash bond slash money, it does kind of add up. And I'm not smart enough to know exactly how that would work out, um, but I think you know, because of the variety of different companies that I get involved with, I think I can at least see the outline of a viable future there. And it, it, it may sound crazy, given everything that's going on in the token space, it may sound crazy to say, actually, the tokens, um, you know, might well form a, a part of this new financial world. But I, I, I think it's true, mm. you know. And there's a potential link, too, it seems like, to... A digital identity, which is another one of your kind of areas of yes, of, of course, of course, right? because and for two reasons. So one is because identity itself, in the form of reputation, um, you know, would become tokenized in that sort of. But you know, Dave money is a reputation currency based on Dave, and that's one viable form of these tokens in the future. But it's also true in the sense that if you're going to have this kind of infrastructure. You have to have an identity infrastructure that goes with it, because otherwise, how do you know that the Dave coins are linked to Dave, and how do you know what reputation Dave has, and how do you know who the executive officers of Dave are, and what other companies, and blah, blah, blah. And if you want to automate all of that stuff, we have to have a digital identity infrastructure. So yes, it's, it's linked from that point of view. It's like they're the two strands of the DNA, you know, the digital money and the digital identity. We have to have both of them in order to grow this new financial services infrastructure. What's interesting to, to think about, almost from a philosophical standpoint, because you can, you're describing this amazingly translucent, to use your terminology, uh, world, in which uh, in the event of misbehavior, uh, fraud, the, 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 veil, the veil can be pulled back effectively. Um, now, some people could jump to kind of, uh, you know, privacy concerns, but I suppose then the challenge is, well, if you've got nothing to hide, then what's what's the issue? Because really all you're doing is eradicating. Well, no, I, 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 think that I think it's a more positive um, structure than that, because I think the, the new techniques that are being forged in that space, which seem very counterintuitive in some ways, because you can do things in the digital world you can't do in the physical world. So in the digital world, we have things like homomorphic encryption for example so I can do computations on encrypted amounts now at the moment it's big and it's slow and it takes too long but you know things evolve so the idea that I can add up all the entries in a ledger without being able to read any of them sounds counterintuitive but that's you can do that now I mean we can't do it quite as cost effectively yet but it's a matter of time you have this whole field of zero knowledge proof springing up where where what you're storing on your ledger are proofs about data, not the data itself. So in other words, you're storing, to, to take the trivial example everybody always uses, you're storing the proof that you're over 18 um, rather than the fact you're over 18 or, or your age or anything else. So, so I think the techniques that, that are coming out of this, this space um, actually afford us more than, than it seems at first glance because I, I agree, it does seem odd. And, and because transparency and translucency are imperfect 
metaphors in that digital world. Um, but actually, the digital world can do some incredible things that the analog world just can't. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I guess, taken to the extreme, we'd be talking about companies, communities, uh, some of the other C's issuing their own currencies, as opposed to using one generally accepted national currency uh, well, listen, the, the, the way know, we do today. You know, I'm, I'm not the only person who's insane enough to think this is on the horizon. I'm, I was reading things just like the... the uh, the chat from the Estonian government was saying, because you know, Estonia are the sort of digital trendsetters and all this, and they're saying, well, we're thinking about doing an ICO for Estonia, which sort of read in a funny way when you. But but his point was, you know, you know, you issue these tokens, people buy them. Why do they buy them? Because they can use them in the future to pay taxes in Estonia, pay fees for government services. You know this kind of thing. So if you think that in the future you're going to want to use, uh, you know, Estonian e-residency or, or, or you know whatever, or have a bank account there or something like that, you might well want to invest in some of these tokens. So you know that's in some ways that's kind of it's sort of a bond, but it's a bond that you can freely trade and it's a bond that you can essentially instantly liquidate in order to purchase other services with. So so it you know. It's not as mad as it as it sounds. There are quite sane people out there well, thinking that, that, about it. That's interesting because, so what happens if twenty years from now the, the value of the Estonian token is close to zero and they're collecting taxes well, the that same, are payable it, it in this? It would right? be the same as the bonds now. You know, I mean, I was just reading in the newspaper this morning. People are buying ten-year Swiss bonds at something like minus one point two five percent yield because they see Swiss government as a safe haven. You know, I mean, uh, the value of bonds can go up as well as down. So that would be no different. But, you know, but, but you could see why you'd want part of that in your portfolio. So I, I want to kind of link all this back to your book also, um, and, and maybe doing that through this kind of interesting point of, of if we move to this tokenized society whereby national currencies no longer exist, uh, in a sense, money as we know it no longer exists because we simply don't uh, don't need that as a means to, let's say, relate uh, one value to another value. Uh, we, we can now do this directly via the value of, of, of tokens in relation to one another. It almost, well, it effectively brings us back to a to a barter system, uh, which we moved away from by developing money because it was tough to divide assets uh, in ways that made them tradable. And in fact, we created money, which was, I guess, the original token, right? The tokenized version of these physical assets. And now we're evolving away from that and, in a sense, kind of circling back to the original. Well, I, I would say I'm 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 more of a Graeberite on that front so you have to define that so so david graber who wrote wrote the the book debt the first five thousand years so so if i was forced to choose i mean obviously the reality of these things is it's a bit of both but if i was forced to choose i would i tend to favor the origins of money in the form of debt line of thinking rather than the origins of money in form of barter line i.e it was created so we could make loans yeah, with credit. Yeah. so so but i mean I, I you know i take your point on board of course um uh, and the answer to that is, broadly speaking, yes, except that it's a it's a sort of turbo virtual barter that you can't really think about. Like I said at the very beginning, if you if you try to imagine, well, I'm going to get on the bus and the bus company needs some paint. And where can I get some paint from? Oh, the golf club's got some spare paint. Um, maybe I can get a discount for using up some. Like that is insane when you think about it. But for your supercomputer to talk to the bus company's supercomputer and resolve these portfolios in nanoseconds across platforms which mean no fraud or... You know, that is a very different world and not at all implausible. So you, you have to think about... I mean, I like teasing people about this kind of thing by talking, especially when people talk about central banks, of course, with reference to the Bank of England, which is just around the corner. You know, it, you know the, the 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 Bank of England was set up to manage debt to fight a war against France, 
you know, n it wasn't set up in order to provide the circulating medium of exchange for, for, for trade and industry. You know, it's like that's not the way these things work. Um, and so the idea that people begin to issue these tokens and then all of a sudden, instead of the government issuing conventional bonds, the government issues its own tokens, which then get traded onto that. And then people want those tokens because they can use them to pay their tax. Not mad at all. And as you get some scale and liquidity in those markets, and money begins to drain out of the less efficient markets, and I have to say more opaque markets, because obviously in this kind of market, the intermediaries would need to earn their money by, by charging fees for useful services, not because they can get away with asymmetric information, uh, insider trading, front running, and all these kind of things. Um, so those would be more efficient markets. Um, so in time, money will just begin to drain. So it's not like anyone will set out with this plan. Let's get rid of government debt. Let's get rid of sterling. That's not the way those things happen. It's just they sort of fall into disuse because everybody else is using more efficient alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the challenges would be the proper management by issuers, in, in this case, of yes. their own currencies. Yes. Because you kind of risk this runaway inflationary situation in which companies to, I suppose, fund themselves or issuing a constant stream of tokens, which is eroding the value of the existing tokens. Yes, well, of course, necessarily... De Bono says, I mean, he's talking about private money tokens only. He's not talking, I mean, government tokens would be subject different. But De Bono says, and again, I stress, this is years ago. He says, well, it, then it becomes incumbent on companies to manage their token issue so that inflation doesn't erode uh, what they're doing. Um, but he makes a very interesting point. He says, actually, it's easier for companies to do that than for governments to do it because companies don't have voters, um, which I think is an interesting point. So companies would compete to keep the value of their tokens up uh, you know, rather, than, rather than see them eroded away, I think, because you want, you want people to want these tokens to purchase your goods and services as opposed to other people's tokens to purchase other people's goods and services. So if I think IBM dollars are going to be worthless in 10 years' time, I, I won't hold them. You know? Whereas if I think they're going to be stable or perhaps even go up, uh, they're more attractive. So is IBM going to be around in 10 years' time? I have no idea. But let's ask Watson. <laughs> She's programmed to say yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so actually one of the questions I want to ask you just personal curiosity. Were there any interesting facts, stories that came out of the, the research for your book uh, before Babylon Beyond Bitcoin? Oh, lots. And in fact, lots that I didn't, I didn't put in that, um, you know, somebody, somebody posted a thing on Twitter the other day, you know, probably the smartest person who's lived in modern times, Richard Feynman. And he said something like his, his model for w was organize, simplify, and tell a story. So, so collect together all of the facts and organize them in a structure that helps you to make predictive uh, comments. You know, simplify it down to the, to the level that you need in order to make those kind of things. And then tell a story about them. And I'm, I'm a big believer of storytelling as a way of getting people to do it. So I was very interested in collecting stories that would help me understand the transition from industrial to post-industrial forms of money. And of course, the only narratives available to us are from the transition from pre-industrial to industrial money. And, and you know, London was the epicenter of that, so it's a useful thing to do. So there's a lot of stories which I think make a very similar point, which is that basically the market always ends up outsmarting the government. <laughs> you know, people talk about this sort of the industrial age settlement between the between the monarch and the city, um, whereby the monarch gave up the power, um, the you know to to the city uh, in return for certain things, and so it's like, what's the next version of that? So here's an example. In uh, France, where they didn't really understand the transition from industrial from pre-industrial to industrial I mean we didn't either but we have the English tradition of sort of muddling through which worked for us rather than the sort of French trend 
of having grand schemes for things which which eventually don't work, like John Law's land bank and the euro and things like that. Um, but one of my favourite examples actually is insurance, which I did include it in the book, which comes from Rebecca's book about the French Revolution. And she says, um, the French court used to sell um, these kind of lifetime. So, so basically, in order to get money for the king, you give the king a load of money. And in return, he gives you an annuity for as long as you live. Okay? And, and so what happened was the bankers uh, figured out actually if you buy one of the because people used to trade these annuities if you buy one that's based on the life of an individual person you're taking a risk because that person might drop dead so but on the other hand if you bought a basket of them for a whole bunch of different people um, you're taking much less of a risk and if you actually if you knew the statistics you'd be able to price that which of course they did and they figure out you know basically women live longer than men did and so basically they wanted to buy and of course you want to buy them on the youngest woman that you can and because some women die in childbirth and so, on. so you need a big portfolio of women and you're in the money because you can calculate these things and the french king can't which turned out to be true by the way so they couldn't let and so so you had this spectacle where where the french court every year would have to send somebody to geneva because because the, the bankers were insuring the ladies of Geneva. They would have to send people to Geneva to check that these women were still alive to carry on paying out the annuity. And in fact, that the, the I think the last person who was paid out in that way died 90 years after the French Revolution or something like this. And it's a mad sort of thing. But the reason I like stories like that, apart from that they humanise some of the issues, is because they make this central point about how the market um, prices, you know, this, this relationship between information and risk. And this is where the transparency stuff translates into actual money and lower costs, isn't it? Because it's, so we want transparency for goodness sake, because we don't like people doing money laundering and insider trading and all these other things. But we also want transparency because it would feed into risk models that would lead to better pricing and then the lower total cost of running the market because obviously if you know the as in the case of these the the geneva bankers if you know the statistics you can price correctly and we're moving into this world we have these floods of data coming in which if you had access to them you know would allow you to price these things very accurately so i do like stories but i, I like stories that that inform something about what's going on now not just stories that have well i, I do like stories with historical interest but I like stories that tell us something about the transition that's underway now. And I, and I keep being drawn back to the fact that if we were, like on this very spot, if we were having this discussion 400 years ago, on this very spot, then we would have been talking about oh, how, you know, there's a crisis of currency, money doesn't work for it. And we wouldn't have really understood that it's because we're in the middle of an industrial revolution and there's a shift to a money wages culture and there's not enough money in circulation to support the wages and the money that's in circulation is of poor quality and leads to high transaction costs because everybody has to weigh the silver because they can't trust it, blah, blah, blah. So if we'd have been sitting around having this discussion 400 years ago, I don't think we would have predicted the Bank of England or the gold standard or paper money as a... You, you know what I mean? Like I, I tease people by saying, like, what would you have come up with? And we'd have been sitting here saying, well, if only there were better quality silver coins. Uh, if only the if only the, the the edges of the coins could be defended against coin clip. You know what I mean? We would have been thinking about things like that. We wouldn't have been thinking in a hundred years' time. There are you know, coins will be irrelevant because we'll be using paper money, and the value of that money will be determined by the gold standard, not by the content of the silver and I, that's how I feel now right so what's coming just around the corner is very hard to predict but I don't think we'll find it by looking at five pound notes and bank issued credit cards I don't think that tells us where we're going to be going next um, and if anything those stories from the past tell you about the way in which David Edgerton this one, he says you know technologies are Creole technologies they, 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 they get used for things they were never intended for. And, and so like, the, story, like the, the tally stick story, which I love, which is in the book, you know, the tally sticks were the, were the wooden sticks they used to, to, to measure government debt 
in the late Middle Age. And, 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 and so these sticks went from a method of recording debt, they went into general circulation because merchants would, would hold, because they were a more convenient alternative to carrying cash. And the discounts went up and down depending on, on a variety of different things. So you have these technologies that get used for things they weren't intended to be used for, but nonetheless, they form the basis of these new markets. And that's why I feel this is a... You know, this is an exciting time because because for, for people, especially old people like me who've been in this market for quite a while, you know, you see these new technologies and you can see the seeds of a new kind of financial infrastructure in these technologies. Not as they are now, but as a, as a Creole platform that's going to get used in a slightly different way. And I, I think, uh, and clearly you do as well, otherwise you wouldn't have picked up on it, I think, I think tokens have a role to play in that. You know, I think people are wrong to just dismiss them as craziness, which is what they look like at first glance, because I think they have some more meaning, so a deeper meaning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Dave, you make some very convincing arguments. And in fact, I think one of the things that separates your writing around this subject, your thing around the subject from those of a lot of others is that you immediately make the connection from what's happening now to, in a very pragmatic way, the way things could actually work in the future, given incumbent interests, given government interests, given political interests, given human nature, as opposed to some of the more, let's say, idealistic, perhaps crypto-anarchist views. But um, fascinating to, to chat. Thanks for the questions. You make me think, and there's no higher compliment. Oh. Dave, remind people where they can find you and tell us where we can buy the book. Uh, well, they can find me at www.dgwbirch.com or on Medium, DGW Birch, or on Twitter, DGW Birch, uh, or at my own blog, which is blog.dgwbirch.com. The book is called um, Before Babylon, Beyond Bitcoin. It's available in all good bookshops, and I hope many of the not so good ones as well. Great. Well, Dave Birch, thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com. 